Ryder, where you're you're in Kentucky? I'm in Kentucky. Whose house Kentucky. are you in? You're in a very beautiful house in it's Kentucky. Gorgeous. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I had friends who um, moved during the pandemic, you know, like how everybody yeah. sort of made big life decisions. Yeah, the great I escape. A, yeah, so some of my, uh, some of our closest friends who like were our neighbors, we used to do a nanny share with, so our, our sons are like best friends. Aww. Unfortunately, they moved all the way to Kentucky um, in the middle of the pandemic. So every summer now we've made it a, a point to get out here and visit them. So I, I was visiting Alex in New York, um, and then on our way back, we decided we'd We'd stop off in Kentucky for a few days. And nice. gosh, it's so gorgeous here. It's so green. Yeah. Guys, yeah. LA is not a green no. place. I was and just back I in just, Connecticut. Same thing. Where yeah, you're just like, it's oh, crazy it's so making. Wonderful. I just forget, yeah. like, you know, how much I need that. <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, I grew up around trees in Northern California. And like, I, I you know, I, I obviously I love LA for so many reasons, mostly cultural, but like uh the the landscape just doesn't have trees. Yeah. And I just don't even think about it until I get someplace like here. And I, you know, my son, Indy's just like running through the grass and there's trees everywhere. And I'm just like obsessed with it. I'm kind of like looking around going, oh, this feeds my soul in some like very real yeah. way, especially also coming from New York City, which of was, course, you know, are you giving are you giving Indy a very good tick check every night when uh, when he comes in? No, that's a good call. That's though, a great sure. call. Yeah, that's the, that's the East Coast thing. It's like, all right, check the socks, check everything. Let's make sure we're good to go here. Another thing we do not have to think about here. Exactly. In LA. You know, exactly. So you just don't have to think about it at all. Well, uh, I am really super excited about this episode. First of all, Me we had too. a wonderful talk and, and reunion with Rusty last week. Oh, how great is he? I mean, God. he's incredible. I love and him. He's awesome. I, I thought it was really interesting that last week in the episode we watched with Rusty, he made the point that Feeney can give different advice than Alan can because Feeney doesn't have kids. And then the next episode... Yep. Was basically all about that. Was about that. And I thought, so did cool. Rusty watch more than one? <laughs> did he watch this episode? No, I'm sure he just remembers that that was like the central tension, you know? Yeah. And these first couple episodes, you can tell they're so uh, Rusty heavy, yes. first of all, which is interesting. Yeah. But then, yeah, you could just tell that, that, you know, one of the central pitches of the show was, what would it be like if your teacher lived next door? Yes. Which, yeah. You know, obviously, because Feeney yeah. became such a legendary character and became such a huge part of our characters' lives, we, we all kind of forgot that that central pitch for an 11-year-old boy like Corey, that's huge. And yeah. playing out that tension for its comedy value and its educational value is super interesting. In the, and that's clearly what they were doing in these first couple episodes. But, I mean, it really was Rusty, Bill, and Ben for the first, yeah. you know, yeah. few episodes. It real, I mean, it, huge. And one of the things we, we should mention, we've... Um, but we talked about the original pilot where Rusty wasn't in it and I wasn't in it either. We, we went back and kind of looked. So while it was called the Untitled Ben Savage Project, it was also called Eleven. Eleven, yeah. Was the name of the show originally. I never remember that. Yeah. I, see, I don't think I ever saw the original pilot. I was just there when we filmed it. I got a copy but for it. Eleven you. is a horrible title. Well, How do you maintain that? Exactly. What do you do next year? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Every exactly. year it changes. So that's what it was. It was Eleven, a.k.a. the Be the Untitled Ben Savage Project. So that's I had crazy. forgotten that entirely, which was weird to see. Well, yeah. I don't want to make our guest today wait very oh, long. Oh, we've been waiting oh. long enough. Welcome to Pod Meets World. I'm Danielle Fischel. I'm Will Friedle. And I'm Ryder Strong. And today... We are so incredibly overjoyed Yay. to welcome to the podcast, Bonnie Bartlett and Mr. Bill Daniels. Yay. Is everybody on their best behavior? Because Mr. Feeney's here. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Here you are! Oh, and in matching colors, too. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, well, isn't that interesting? It just happened. What? It really, it just happened. What? I mean, I heard this first, then he came up and he said, oh, "Can I wear this?" And I said, "Yeah." You so guys yeah. look fantastic. Is oh, that is amazing. this what is this what happens when you've been married for seventy years? Yes, and you know what? June thirtieth. It'll be 71 years. Oh my gosh. Congratulations, Seven, guys. <laughs> also, uh, if, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, Bonnie, was very recently, you just had a birthday. Yesterday. Yesterday. My, my 93rd birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, 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 Bonnie. <laughs> wow. Bill is 95 and I'm nine, now I'm 93. Unbelievable. Oh Unbelievable. Can I ask you guys, what do you think the key to 71 years of marriage is? Billy, you, you know the answer to that. Well, <laughs> respect, 
Mm. And honest communication. Yeah. I mean, that sounds sounds like a really good foundation for almost every relationship. You're right. Yes. Yes. It doesn't matter who the person is. If you have those two things, you could probably make it work. Well, and you have to be flexible. Mm. I mean, you really do. You have to be willing to change. Yeah. something's not good you have to be willing to ch- make the changes both of you if yeah. one person changes and the other person doesn't it doesn't work but if both people make changes to uh make it better to- well let me ask you let me ask you about this then because i'm super fascinated do you mean you but you guys are both actors incredibly successful actors uh how did that i mean would you have had it any other way uh, you know, in other words, you mustn't have known actors who married people outside of the industry or, you know, people who were industry couples like you two. I mean, how did that how was that? How did that happen? Uh, did you work together first and then fall in love or did you just happen to meet? And, and no, t- we, I want to hear more about that. We we met in a classroom at Northwestern. Uh, oh. I didn't know her. Uh, uh, we were auditioning for a play, hmm. and uh, there were people sitting around. And uh, you know, I'd been on Broadway, so I was a cocky kid, right? <laughs> so uh, I listened to these been. kids, and I thought, "Oh my God, I'm not sure I want to be in this bomb." And then I heard somebody <laughs> in the back of the room who was an actress. You could tell. So I looked around and there she was. So I waited at the door for her and I said, how about a cup of coffee? And she said, you're too short. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, come on, have a cup of coffee. She said, okay, (laughs) no coffee. And she'd been following me around the campus, Uh... unbeknownst to me. Oh, so she really was a good actress. I was a big, I was a big uh, fan, or whatever you call all our fans. You know, I was one of them. All the people nice. that follow. I follow. So you were playing it cool. Any celebrity, <laughs> any celebrity that was in my sight, I would follow. You know, later on in New York, I followed Greta Garbo down Fifth Avenue a couple of times. Wow. Eleanor Roosevelt, I followed her in New York. So anyway, I was that kind of person, just a shadow person, you know? So yeah. it never occurred to me that we would meet. It never occurred to me that we would become boyfriend, girlfriend. Never occurred to me because yeah. he was out of my realm. You know what I mean? He was like, yeah. he was like special. And yeah. and he always had this little Italian girl with him. So <laughs> who was I, that? What? Who was he, that? That was uh, one of the girls in school. Wow. You know, in school, he, he, when I would see him on the on the subway or whatever you call that, the L, <laughs> he was going down to to a play. You know, in Chicago, the whole group. He was always mm-hmm. with this little Italian girl. I'm a, a big blonde. <laughs> you know? I mean, I never thought of me with him that way but i was impressed because and he had a leather jacket also i liked nice <laughs> nice he was in the Sean. Sean hunter tradition. <laughs> yes, tradition that's amazing so anyway that's and when i said you're too short what i meant was oh no no i i'm i'm too big for you you know i'm a, i'm I'm tall, used to these big Swedish boys and uh, Moline. <laughs> big Swedish? <laughs> Swedish, yes, because Moline was very Swedish. Hansen, Carlson, Nielsen, uh-huh. you know, all that. And so I was dumbfounded that he yeah. would be interested in me and as so a girlfriend. After that first cup of coffee, did you guys just continue? Was that just the beginning of, of a 71 year relationship? That's correct. We were. We were together. Tied at the hip. From then on. Wow. And when did you guys first actually work together? That in that play. Oh, you did that play? Oh my God. We did that play. It was um, Bury the Dead. Bury the Dead by Irwin Shaw. Irwin Shaw. Okay. I had a very dramatic part. Kill them all, you know, very dramatic. (sighs) And uh, and he was the head of the union, (laughs) I think. Oh my gosh. He was the head of the union. A very dark play, very dark anti-war play by Owen Shaw. Unbelievable. And so did you guys continue to 
consciously choose to work together or did it just kind of happen because people just associated happened. you with one? Just yeah. happened. As a matter of fact, we were both in positions. I on the soap opera, but we never interfered with each other's. We never said, oh, I want my husband to be on this. Or, oh, I want my wife. Right. You, know, you never like demanded it contractually never, or even anything. Even in St. Yeah. Elsewhere, it just happened. Just oh, happened. Great. Wow. St. Elsewhere, time, which you both won Emmys. The only time Emmys. when it was consciously done was when Michael Jacobs asked me to come in on that last year. Yes. Sure, well, yeah. yeah. So I'm, for everyone listening, yeah. and just in case you didn't know, obviously Bill Daniels is Mr. Feeney and <laughs> Bonnie came on and joined, joined us for the last season where she played the Dean. Dean Bolander. And Mr. Feeney and the Dean fell in love. And um, yeah. it's actually one of our fans' most favorite things when they realize you guys are married in real life. Yeah. And they go, wait, <laughs> you know what happened and the Chicago, Dean? I, I went to Chicago for a golden and girls convention because I played a, a villain on a, an episode of Golden Girls called Barbara Thorndike, a real anti-Semite, a terrible, terrible girl, terrible. Girl. <laughs> and so I went there and I'm signing, you know, autographs and doing things. And this little girl is about 12, 14, maybe. And she came up and she looked at a picture down here and she looked up and she said, <gasps> You're Mrs. Feeney. <laughs> oh, it's Mrs. Feeney. She got to the side and started. I never had that. It was never called Mrs. Feeney. <laughs> she connected it. And I thought that was so sweet. Oh, yes, honey. <laughs> that so, is. Oh, oh man. So, so emotional about this show. Don't they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, everybody does. Yeah, and I'm especially for you, Bill, I imagine people must look up to you and immediately feel like you're this great authority and this yeah. vast wealth of knowledge that they can tap into. Oh, I don't know. I think so, yeah. 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 You're, you're a, you were the teacher for many generations now. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. moving from generation to generation of Mr. Feeney right. was my teacher. Right, so. and then they ask, they ask, uh, they they say, oh, I want my children to watch. And then they yeah. have their children watch the show. Yeah. Yes. And they love the show. So, Bill, how did Boy Meets World come to you? Did you have to audition? Was it offered to you? What what was the situation there? It was Michael Jacobs. Michael right? Jacobs, yeah. I, uh, I asked for a meeting because I turned it down. Uh. And uh, he wanted to know why. I said, well... That's a funny name, and I don't really, want to, <laughs> I don't really want to make fun of teachers. I, I, I respect them, and they were underpaid and all that. And he said, and then he told me what my role was based on, which was a mentor of his when he was in high school. So a mentor of his. So I realized that the part would be treated with respect. Right, he yeah. Re he rewrote something, too. Did he? Yeah, the, 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 uh, he rewrote something, and the powers that be didn't want it, but he made them, he made them do it. And that's what sold you. That mm -hmm. first episode got, was a lot of serious stuff. Oh. Yes. He, he gave them a lot of serious stuff. Yeah. And, but Michael was willing to do that and capable of doing that. And he went against uh, the heads the network. of ABC to do it. Network. Yeah. yeah. You know, if I remember correctly, it was actually after the table read that we had, we did have a table read. Yes. And and then then uh, Bill was very upset. Yes. Um, and the table read did not go well, if I remember, in, over, uh, in general. And Bill was upset. The network was upset. And Michael was sort of stuck in between the two impulses and ended up rewriting the entire script that night. He did. You're um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then Bill was happy. And, and but I, I remember Bill threatening to leave or that's the story I heard, at least. Yes, um, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's the, because yeah. they, he didn't feel like Mr. Feeney was being re, like res, was he was being treated with yeah. respect. Yes. Wow. Yeah. He didn't I was want afraid to... that it might be. Yeah. Uh, Silly. The brunt of a joke. Right. Kind of. Well, that's that's it's very common in television is is the teacher is kind of the buffoon and the the yes, kids are sir. the kids are pulling one that's over right. on the teacher every time. And, that's and right. yeah, that that was just the television trope that you would always see. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's that's didn't want to do. also after St. Elsewhere, um, uh, everybody wanted, as a matter of fact, both of us, they wanted us to do comedy. We built turned down one comedy after another. 
Hmm. because he didn't want to do it. But that, you know, that's the natural thing to do after a, a serious thing. Then you do a comedy. He didn't want to Lighten. do a comedy. And I, gosh, I went through a lot of times when I would like to have done it, but he said no. And so uh, then when this came up, he really didn't think it would would work and he didn't really think that he wanted to do it seven years later <laughs> there you and go. he had a great time and he loved it and i think that's due to michael jacobs first of all and then all of you guys he really did you know respect you well and it that- also brought him to a whole new fandom because, I mean, you've got, you know, St. Elsewhere is one kind of group of fans and even 1776 is one kind of group of fans. But now to be on a show where the fans grow up watching you, yeah. it's a completely different vibe when you when you've got somebody raised watching you on television. It's uh, yeah, now. So, yeah. Bill, when you when you look back on the shows that you do, is there one group of fans that that you tend to get recognized for something more than than something else? Definitely not saying else or interesting. Um, yeah. I think Mr. Feeney. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. yeah. definitely. It's the, it's the thing that, yeah. what do you call it? Popular culture or something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it became the most iconic, right? Because saying elsewhere would probably be the most critically acclaimed. Yes. yes. Of all sure, the shows. Sure. Yeah. Right. Followed yeah. by Knight Rider. I was, I, was, <laughs> uh, Knight Rider. I, I remember in New York oh, right. on the street and a bus came by, I'm walking along and a bunch of kids got off the bus and they saw me and they said, Mr. Feeney. And they come running and I ran around the block. <laughs> he ran away from them. He said, he said to me, sorry, I'll see you later. And he ran. <laughs> so dignified, they Mr. Feeney. Him. They absolutely terrified him. Yes. And they Bill. can be in New York, particularly uh, when when Bill wrote a book and and we went to a signing, they were voracious, chased us around, jumped on the car, did all kinds of things. Wow. (laughs) In New York. Yeah. Yeah, They were Feeny fanatics. I am calling it hashtag Feeny fanatics. Feeny fanatics. I don't imagine fans of the zoo story on Broadway were were jumping on cars. We're the same. No, 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 no. Bill, what oh. are your memories? What are your memories of meeting all of us for the first time? And what was that like to work with uh, basically 12 year olds? Yeah. Well, you were all were young and having fun. And I was much more serious. <laughs> yes. So I would hang out in my dressing room away from you all as you fooled around before the camera. And then they said, Mr. Daniels, we're ready for you. And I, then I'd go out. <laughs> you guys were having a ball. And i would taken it very seriously. Yeah. Frankly, I'm, I wish I were one of you. Right? <laughs> yes, he would like to have been one of you guys and having fun. <laughs> Did you enjoy the live studio audience? Oh, yes. I much prefer a live audience. Uh, And that's from my work on Broadway. Uh, You know, when, uh, you know, when you start on something and uh, they're rustling the papers and programs and so forth, and uh, you start, and then when you can hear a pin drop, you know you were doing okay, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you it's quite that. different. I remember, <laughs> yeah, you I remember you would sit in your dressing room and you would play chess against yourself. <laughs> and then I I asked you one day, I said, Will you will you teach me how to play? And you went, sure. And we did that for, for a couple of weeks. You taught me how to play chess, and then I think you kind of went, I, I want to go back and play against myself again. <laughs> I'm a much better player. I'm a much you. better player when I play against myself. Yes, is, is, is how I recall it. More of a challenge. <laughs> now, Bill, we've been we've been doing this rewatch podcast for this is our third rewatch episode. And these first three episodes have been so incredible. And and there's always been at least one, if not two, very uh, Mr. Feeney and Corey Matthews scenes. This is now the second episode I'd like to go on record saying the second episode where I fully welled up. I thought I was going to start having tears fall down my face. I was able to stop them before they fell down my cheeks. But you and Ben together are 
absolute magic in, especially in these early episodes. Yeah. Yes. What yeah. was that like working with Ben? Well, it, it was the same as working with you all. It really was very pleasant. I, I stayed away from being judgmental. I took whatever you gave me and I tr tried to work with it. And it worked out very well. Uh, I didn't want to be somebody who was uh, older and more knowledgeable and making m remarks, uh, uh, criticizing your work or suggesting. Uh, I did none of that. Yeah, uh, you did not. You I remember I said that to him. I said, "Don't do you help them?" He said, "No, they're on my level. Yeah. They're 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 the same level I am. I can't I can't." Help tell them, and we felt that we felt like we felt so respected yeah. in a way. I mean, we've talked about that on on this set. Yeah, I mean, having been on other sets as a kid, yeah. it wasn't always like it. In fact, most of the time, it was not that. So to have that respect from the adults, especially the ones as as experienced and seasoned as you, was such a an amazing feeling. It, it, it made us. I don't know. It, it made us all up our game, I think. Well, you also, Bill, you, you, so you talk about in your book, which is, um, there I go again, how I came to be Mr. Feeney, John Adams, Dr. Craig, Kit, and many others, which is a wonderful book that you wrote. You, in the beginning, you talk about how you were a child actor. Did yeah. that affect in any way, shape or form how you dealt with us? Yes. Oh, yes. I felt my, I haven't had a mother that put my sister and I in the business. She was very judgmental. <laughs> yes, and Tell ambitious. And she was, a, uh, she was a classic stage mom in that yes, sense. Yes, totally. totally. And frankly, I really didn't have a normal childhood. I was over at NBC with the Horn and Heart of Children's Hour for wow. years. And uh, I really kind of resented it. Unt you know, until I realized uh, the better aspects of the work, uh, of what it could mean uh, to do your job as best you could. Mm. And uh, that's, there's an audience out there. So... Um, she was terrible. <laughs> and I, she was so, and I think that, and I loved her. She was a great grandma, but she was a terrible mother. But uh, uh, I think that those early scenes with Ben, I think that whether he knew it or not, he was Ben. Do you know wow. what I mean? Bill right. mm. was Ben, and this sweet kid that brand new, you know, as far as he knew, just starting to act and just using his instincts no training or anything, just instinctively acting in a lovely yeah. personality. And I think that's connected, Bill, to him. Yeah. And then all of you later. But well, I it shows. I mean, it, it, it certainly good. shows. Yeah, it shows. And so, Bonnie, what kind of father and now what kind of grandfather is Bill? What has he we know Bill as as this, you know, um, we remember him being so incredibly professional on set with us. I remember him s taking his lines very seriously, holding the script or his cards that he had where he had his lines written and not wanting to mess up, being very hard on himself about yeah. being very, very hard, on very himself. hard on himself. He, I, I saw him once go up on uh, 1776. He went up where they gave him a new lyric and he blew it. He came in to the dressing room, went into the bathroom and wouldn't come out. He was crying in the oh, bathroom. Wow. And this was as a grown man, you know, and everybody else was laughing. Right. No, yeah, no one, it wasn't a big deal to anyone else. Right. Like you guys would. You'd laugh yeah. when somebody oh, comes yeah. up. He, he, just, he would cry because he was yeah. still a little boy. Had his mother saying, da, 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 da. can't you get that? Is that so hard to get? Mm. Oh, Here, do it again. Wow. Do it again. Oh. And then he'd sit in the back seat of the car and do it correctly for her. Wow. So he, he had made a mistake. Dying That's to amazing. know what kind of father is he? He, you know, I was so worried. Mm. Well, I was <laughs> Alice actress anyway, but so I didn't want to have children. And uh, Bill wanted to have children more than I did, but I thought, no, this wouldn't work because, very frankly, he was an angry guy. And mm. I thought, oh, he would be tough on kids. You know, I thought he would mm -hmm. be, I was afraid. And then as it turned out, 
he was a terrific father. And uh, he, he, both the boys, I, I think they were very different and he adjusted to each one. Wow. To, so that they could be who they wanted to be and who they were. He didn't ever try to, he, he never tried to make either of our boys like him or to do anything that special, just grow up. And they're very different. And they, they've, they've turned out to be very wonderful men and fathers themselves. So he, he was a very good father. Very How- good father. Well, that was one of the things that amazed me was what I like to call the two bills. And I'm one of the few people that got to see that where, you know, on set, Bill, you were the consummate professional. We just wanted to earn your approval and have scenes with you. We were all going to Michael at different times saying, "We can we please have a scene with Bill Daniels? This is all we wanted. And then you both very nicely invited me to come up to Santa Barbara uh, because you, Bonnie, were, were working with a, a ballet company. Yes. And I had grown up going to the ballet and you said, I'd like you to come up. And I got to to hang out with Bill off the set a little bit. And the first thing he did was walk up to me with a big smile on his face and throw his arms around me. And I looked around going like, who, what, what's going on? <laughs> who, is, who is this guy? But it's because we weren't on set. It wasn't a professional yeah. atmosphere. And so he was on set. This is about work. This is what you do. This mm-hmm. is your job. You take it very seriously. And then offset you can go and be the type of happy-go-lucky person you want to be. And that was one of the first times where I really realized that that really struck me as, oh, you're right. Yes, we're having fun. And yes, we're young, but this is our job. We've got to take it very seriously. And we all, as young actors, have talked about going to our next job after Boy Meets World and being on time, knowing our lines, making sure we had our marks down, being very professional, and looking at the other kids we were working with going, wow, they did not have William Daniels on the set with them when they were learning how to do it because we all took away the professionalism. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the, one of the things that I think, you know, meant the most to me was just kind of, oh, that this is how you're a professional. Um, he, he's very much more professional than I am too. I, I can be, um, I don't know. I, I, I love camera. I love to be on camera. I love all that. But I, I don't prepare the way he does. I prepare very differently. And I might say a line differently than it's written or something like that. And he does not believe in that. And uh, uh, he, he's not, um, what can I say? He's never allowed himself to be um, loose, like Ed Begley, yeah. somebody yeah. like that. You know, he, right. he doesn't right. allow that. He doesn't allow that. And he's really good at it because he's funny. He very has a funny. Natural, he has a natural wit. And uh, that's what improvisation needs, is that wit. And Mm -hmm. that was very good in uh, uh, St. Elsewhere, for instance. The wit is very important. He's always Mm. said that. He said, a serious play always needs humor, you know, because you got to have it. He he will always look for the funny funny bit. And in that play, you miss the funny part. He says that to me all the time. Uh, thousand yeah. clowns and a thousand clowns is a line where the guy says you miss the funny part and he uses all those lines to me. Yeah. Very uh he's very tough on me on set, but I don't mind it. Do you know what I mean? I just don't mind mm-hmm. it. But he's openly tough on me, yes. And he can be a tough guy, very tough guy. I remember, Bill, you telling me about opening night of the zoo story, the great Edward Albee play that you starred in on Broadway. And I remember you telling me that when the first line came out, you were you were I forget the character's name, but you're the the sort of straight man on, on the bench. And the guy comes up behind you and says, I've been to the zoo. And you just looked up and just by your look. The audience broke and laughed. Yeah, they went and I remember, every yeah, time. And, every and then I remember, and then you said Edward Albee freaked out the first night because he was like, why are they laughing? This isn't funny. This is supposed to be a very serious play. But <laughs> yes. you guys kept finding laughs. Yes. And I've always remembered that. Yeah. Such a great play. <clears throat> he, didn't, he didn't know the well, yeah. humor that was in the play. Right. You know, right. Even though he wrote it. And I didn't know it either, but... Uh, all I did was look up, you know, because that's a funny line. I've been to the zoo, yeah. you know, and um, we learned to accept it you know, because right. it meant that the audience was with you yeah. right away. 
And I thought I was just this guy sitting on the bench. He had all the lines. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they, I realized after a while that they saw the play through my eyes Yeah. Right. about him, who was a strange fellow, you know. Mm-hmm. But I realized that wasn't just a sit there part. It was a very po- important part of the play. It yeah, well, I mean, it's in some ways, I mean, also what you do with Mr. Feeney, you get so many laughs without ever having to be very uh, animated. Oh. You know, there's not oh, a whole lot comical. of like, it doesn't no, yeah. he's not comical. He, you're, you're kind of just a version of Bill Daniels, right? Yeah. This sort of, and yet you are getting so many laughs constantly, uh, you know, and I feel like the rest of us are hamming it up or hitting these beats and yeah. you never have to do a thing. You just kind of but that's, you do your that's thing. exactly why Mr. Feeney and Eric worked so well together. Yes. yes. Because they were Her- such just opposites when it came to everything comedically yeah. that it did work. It just worked. It was that the classic straight man, uh, uh, joker clown put together. And yeah. it's that's where you find the comedy. It's it's that's amazing. The same as uh, with Ed Bentley. Ed Be- well, I was one of the greatest compliments I ever got. We were about season six of Boy Meets World. And Bill, you came up to me and you put your arm around me and it said, it looks like you're my new Ed Bagley. Hmm. Oh, and no. you and you walked away. And it was, I remember just thinking like, that is the coolest thing. And I'm going to go buy a Tesla. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, very, very neat. Very neat. Bill, you played Mr. Braddock in The Graduate, an absolutely iconic movie, an iconic role. What did you learn from Mike Nichols? Oh, well, Mike was a a performer himself Mm -hmm. uh, with Elaine May. He would pick people carefully and then he would direct them only minimally. He didn't, he let you alone Mm. uh, unless he saw something that was wrong, but uh, he just let you alone. And I I don't remember any uh, actual direction that he gave me. Hmm. Interesting. He let me do it the way I was going to do it. Yeah, it was more about the casting in the first place. And he fired people when he felt they were wrong. And he always said, it's my mistake. I made the mistake. He fired a very, very famous actor who's retired now. He was cast and 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 he fired him. Um, oh, gosh. He lives in uh, Santa Fe. Uh, he retired. He was a great film actor. Very big star. Uh, he thought that was the end of his, oh. his life. What? Gene Hart. Gene Hackman. Ah. Gene Hackman. Wow. Oh, wow. He fired Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman was originally in The Graduate. Yeah. No and way. He, he got fired before they started filming. Yeah. And uh, he was with Bill. He said to me, this is the end of my career. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bill said, oh, you know. And, of course, he went on to fame and fortune immediately. Right. But anyway, uh, Mike just said, I made a mistake. Wow. He, he got the cast together and he apologized about letting Gene go he said it was my mistake Mm. not his yeah right well this is an interesting something that i've often wondered about it seems like because i i i remember you telling us that you had no idea what the graduate was that it would become such a big thing and i feel like that's often the case as an actor you never know you know you never was there ever a time where you were able to look around and say oh i am a part of something really special or you knew exactly how big something was going to be yes i i think it's a truism that no one knows what's going to work and what isn't until they they tried it and uh, the graduate was one of them. Uh, you know, we didn't know this young man. Uh, I think Mike knew. Yes, he did. Mike Nichols knew. Yeah, he saw him off Broadway. And they wanted um, uh, uh, Redford. Robert oh, okay. Redford. Robert, Robert Redford. Redford. Right. The, the, the uh, studio wanted Robert Redford. Typical, you know, young, good. And Mike said, no, I want this guy from New York. 
And he was in a position to call all the shots at that point because he had been very successful. And he did, he had already done Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Yeah, so it was an interesting experience. He was very funny, Mike. Oh God. He, he could make anybody laugh at any given time. I remember uh, they were photographing Dustin in the, in the pool and he was going over it with the cinematographer because they had a guy underwater that was going to shoot up underwater from uh -huh. one point of view. And I came over to see how it was being done. And he's talking to his cinematographer and he senses I'm there. And he says, what? To me, what? <laughs> I said, I just want to see how, how you were going to shoot this. He turned to his cinematographer and said, why is he attacking me? <laughs> <laughs> he, would, he would call, and if I answered the phone, he'd say, Bonnie, and I said, oh, yes, sir. And he'd say, did we, were we ever married? <laughs> no, I remember you. He said, no, 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 I never met you. He said, yes. He said, you were very big in my life. He said, you were Strasburg's secretary, and uh, you were very important, and I paid Thirty dollars a month for that, and I, I said, "Oh no, I, 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 I don't remember." And finally, I said, "Well, if I'd known you were going to be so famous, I would have remembered." You. <laughs> 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 oh. I was so embarrassed. I did not. How do you forget Mike Nichols? I had forgotten. Oh, that's so <laughs> funny! Oh my gosh! So I have a question for you, Bill. It, it, your your career has been so prolific. Is there a role that you really wanted that you didn't get? Ever that you can remember? I, 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 you know what? I, I can sort of answer that because what? he has been quoting Hamlet all of our married life. And mm. I think that although he never expressed it even to himself, I think he identified with that part very much and would like to have played that. <laughs> he was very good in Shakespeare. He was a Macbeth, very good Macbeth, oh, wow. especially in the later part. Uh, that was at Northwestern. But I know, but you were good. <laughs> and you were very good at uh, older. You could and you must have done Lady Macbeth, Bonnie, at some point, right? Yeah. I was good yeah. in the sleepwalking scene, not so good in the first part. That's right. harder. Yeah. The harder part. The letter. Yeah. Tough. Yeah. To come out and do that. Well, and it was, I would have, I would have directed it totally differently than they did. I would have now, yeah. And you know something? It's maybe it's because it's Shakespeare, but it never is out of my head. Wow. Lines wow. Come back all the time. And he does lines from from Shakespeare all the time, you know, just quietly sitting there. But I so do great. think he would have been a terrific Hamlet. He would have been. Hmm. Bill, do you remember the feeling you had, or was there a specific moment when you knew that Boy Meets World was a hit? When did you know? Boy Meets World was a hit. Gosh, I don't remember. I'm guessing uh, it was before having to run away from all the people in New York. <laughs> no, <laughs> or maybe no, that, that was it. It was that. It was that New York experience, it, yeah? Said, yeah, see, I think, I think none of us really quite realized how much of a hit the show was until... After. After it was canceled. Yeah. But it wasn't. I feel like the early aughts. Uh -huh. well, yeah. It wasn't really a hit. It was on, but we were never, we never right. got any of the publicity that every other show got. We just. No, you didn't. And you never no. up for Emmys or anything. No, no. we just kept no. going. We were like Wings for kids. It was a show everyone's like, wasn't <laughs> well, Wings, wings <laughs> on for a season? It's like, no, we were on for eight years. It was one and of those. Who, uh -huh. who would yeah. ever have imagined how this has come back, how the yeah. people love you all and they want yeah. to see you all and they want to, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing. Okay. I have another question then, Bill. Do you have a Mr. Feeney type in your life or an educator that you think back to that really like made such a huge impact on you? I was in a play on um, Broadway. Actually, I was an understudy, but it, it was a play with four sons called Life with Father. And uh, I was the understudy. And as the oldest got to be 18 and was drafted, they'd all move up. And then I found myself at the bottom of the list. <laughs> and uh, 
But Mr. Lindsay came back into the play after having taken a year off of it. Howard the Lindsay. Play, Howard Lindsay. The play ran for seven years. Wow. Uh, it was a huge hit. So um, I know that I was going to be drafted. But first so, of all, you got to rehearse with him, and that was the thing when he came back into the play. That's oh, yeah, when you yeah. got together. Yes. Oh, yeah. He, oh, he had a... He had a moment with me where uh, and we we're in rehearsal. Because he came back to the play and he had to rehearse yeah. to get into it. And Bill was already in it. Yeah. So uh, he said, um, at this point, there'll be a huge laugh, Bill. He said, so just look in my eyes and it will tell you when to do your line. Mm. And I thought, mm. man, that's pretty strange. <laughs> but it happened. He yeah. could release you with his eyes to say your line. But you had to wait because it was a huge laugh. And, you know, those laughs go up and they level and they just start to come down. That's when you come in with your line. Yeah. And that's yeah. what he wanted from me. But he released me at that moment with his eyes. Wow. It was an amazing man. And then, and, and then I said, I went to him in the dressing room and I said to him, uh, uh, Mr. Lindsay, you know, I'm going to be drafted. And when I get back, I, I want to, uh, should I go? I was thinking of going to the, uh, what was it? Uh, the, the Academy of uh, Acting in New York. Very famous. Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, he said he was at his dressing table. He said, close the door. And I closed the door and he said, don't go there. At this, yeah. He said, I'm on the board. <laughs> don't go there. He said, what you do is you write the Board of Education for colleges that have good speech schools and drama sections, which I did. I wrote uh, the government and I got an uh, board of education. I got an answer back and it was Yale, uh, UCLA, Northwestern. Wow. And so I was out with my sister. And Catholic, the one where Walter Kerr was. Oh yeah, and Catholic University. University. So um, I was out with my sisters who were in a play with Walter Houston. My little sister was, um, I don't know how old she was. Seven. Seven. She played, it was called Apple of His Eye, uh, Walter Houston. He, he was a great man. And uh, so uh, I, uh, I went up there and uh, they gave me a uh, a, a thing. To, a test? Uh, they a, test. a test. An entrance exam. I had, I had no education. He had no education. No education. That was what, I that's, was a, what, that, that's what uh, Howard Lindsay said. You do that and you're going to get an education. He said, you, you need to get an education. And that's why he said, go to college. Don't go to the uh, American uh, actors thing in New, York. in New York. Right. So don't, in other words, don't just worry about your acting. Worry about educating that's yourself right. in broader Made sense. education. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Most of the best advice. Absolutely ever, right. Bill's parents never graduated from high school. Wow. They wow. never even graduated. They never went to high school. I have a funny story about that. I, I, uh, my sisters were in Chicago in a play with Walter Houston. And I was out visiting them. And my mother said, I think one of those schools up there somewhere uh, is one of the schools that uh, you wrote uh, that was recommended. And uh, so I went up without an appointment and I see this beautiful school on the, on the, uh, the, the lake. Like, yeah. And the campus and everything. And I, you know, and I didn't have much of an education. We were actors, you know, we didn't. So they were poor. <laughs> yeah. Poor Brooklyn. Poor Brooklyn. Poor Brooklyn, right. 
And so uh, I went up there and uh, I walked around until I found the person who, who uh, would interview me. And uh, you, you, you took the test. They said you were in uniform. Oh, yeah. And you had been on Broadway. Yeah. Uh, I took this test and the room was filled with other people taking the test. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, could be yes, could be no. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, and pretty soon I heard, and I look up, it's the teacher. And he said, are you finished? Well, I wasn't even halfway through it. <laughs> oh my I said, yeah, I guess so. And I had on paper and I got on the train going back down to Chicago and I thought, well, I blew that. But um, they accepted me. Yeah. And I think they accepted me because I'd been on Broadway. Oh, yeah. I think <laughs> yeah. Cool speech, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. But, you know, when he started out, when I met Bill, his grades were A, B, C, D. He had the two speech courses were A and B. And then yeah. he had the D were political science or something, which he didn't often take a test or something, you know. By the time we ended, he got a full scholarship to do for a master's. He was a straight A plus, 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 wow. plus. Wow. Because he was a natural, but he'd never, didn't know how to do it. And of course, I was a professional student. <laughs> and so I just helped him to learn how to be a student. And he yeah. was top, 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 top. He, now, Bill, I've heard you tell the story before because you don't have a Brooklyn accent at all. You have actually a very refined American standard yes. accent, which when I was a kid, I completely thought was British. We, we, all, did. we, all, thought we all thought you were British. Yeah. <laughs> British. Yes, I remember asking you, are you from London? And you just kind of sheepishly went, no, it sounds like that, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. But so uh, you actually you actually trained yourself to get the, your accent from the play that you mentioned, Living with Father, right? Life with Father, yes. Life with Father, uh, yeah. I, uh, I kind of picked it up naturally, really from the other people in the cast yeah and the, the brooklyn accent went and it was something like a new england accent or, or yeah. very yeah. close to british accent mm -hmm. uh, and i picked that up without realizing it uh so I just, when uh, he was yeah it, it's hard i've never understood it because i know his whole family and when he was a little boy, he didn't want to be in Brooklyn. He didn't want to go to the automat. He was like always, always different. His, he's yeah. totally different from his family. And I don't know. You're just born that way. I don't yeah. know where it comes from. <laughs> but he's totally different from his, everything about him is different yeah. from his family, except his father was also a very angry man. And that the anger he got from his dad. <laughs>What does it mean to you when when people come up to you and tell you that they themselves have become a teacher because of you and your role as Mr. Feeney? Oh, well, I thank them and I wish them well. Uh, it doesn't happen that often. But oh, it happens all the time in the cameos that you do. Oh, um, yeah. And he's very, that makes him very happy because that's real on Bill's part. Education and teachers yeah. and he just... It changed his life, and he just loves people who become teachers. He does. I mean, Bill, if you don't hear it every single day, it is only because people end up feeling too shy to tell you, because we hear it. All the time. Yeah, every, I hear it all, all the time. All the time. You have made such an impact for so many different reasons over the course of your career, but oh. especially Mr. Feeney uh -huh. has made such an impact on generations of children because of the people who were so inspired by you that have now gone on to become teachers yeah. themselves. And they're using you and Mr. Feeney as an example of what kind of teacher to be. All those, all those students under those teachers are benefiting from you without even knowing it. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Well, that's true. Uh -huh. And in and, and all those parts, yeah, that has come through. And I, I think that's just been, 
Yeah. Yeah. I really think that's just who he is. Uh, and, and the, how he registers to people. And uh, I don't know what you call that. You call I, it the ultimate definition of lead by example. Yes. Okay. Is what it seems to be. Because again, with Bill, he, he never taught us. It was just we learned by being around him. So it was that lead by example. This is look at what I can emulate if I just try a little harder. Um, so I think it was actor, that. As an actor, something comes through that is... I think special. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Well, they cut, they talk about it or the X factor. Those are, those are words you hear all the time that, well, how do you describe it? You can't, you, you point at it. And I think that's, yeah, I think Bill's got it in spades. Yeah. Yeah. Bonnie, what what are your memories of being on Boy Meets World? Well, it was so fun and easy. I had never been terribly comfortable on, uh, uh, sitcoms. I, I, I'm better I, uh, uh, as a dramatic actress, very dramatic. And um, uh, so I had been on Barney Miller and it was a very successful, funny shows. I, I did okay. And then I did that Golden Girls. I didn't think anything of it until much later. And then that character became the mean, blonde, Legendary. Midwestern, you know, behind the scenes terrible lady um which i knew how to do (laughs) (laughs) but uh so when michael asked me to do it i was kind of flattered and he never asked me to do the only thing he ever asked me to do i couldn't do was click my fingers we spent a half an hour (laughs) trying to get me to click my fingers finally he said i give up I can be funny in a different way, but it's not his way. It's it's just totally different. But I don't have that. I don't have that funny bone. Well, you, you both, what you both do, you stuff. both you both have the set. It's just that you have different senses of I humor. I mean, Bonnie, you are an Emmy winner. Yes, <laughs> and <laughs> very funny. You're also very funny. It's just it's it's. I remember Bill telling me. I'm not Bill, witty. Well, no, yes, you sure you are. It's just a different. It comes out. It, it, Bill is very quick when it comes to that kind of. Kind of, you know, we we will do conventions together, and Bill might only say two or three things on stage, but they bring the house down. I mean, yeah. the, the timing is perfect, the line is perfect. Bill, I remember you telling me one story about a joke on Saint Elsewhere that you thought was hysterical, where you were playing the piano, <laughs> and there was a um, a, a vase of flowers on the piano. Do you remember? Do you remember this joke? Yeah, this was. Bruce Paltrow's and the writer's jokes. Uh, they always tried to fool the censors. Yeah. To put in something uh, very dirty and the censors <laughs> won't get it. Really? That's oh, this is such, oh, yeah. such a great joke, thing. too. That was their big thing. And, <laughs> and what was it that's two? Two lips on the piano. Two lips on the organ. Two lips on the organ. Two lips on the organ. <laughs> Bill was sitting there playing and he said, there's nothing and better than two lips say. on the organ. I didn't organ. want to do it. I didn't <laughs> want to do it. You thought it was crap. Two lips. He said, so he would say, two lips on the organ. And they said, no, no, no. Two lips on the organ. No, no. They fought <laughs> I That's a pretty clever joke. Tell, I have to it say. was a great joke. I remember you telling me that and and just losing it for days. Tulips on the organ. Oh, so funny. <laughs> oh my gosh! Wow. Well, are there uh, any actors you wish you could work with again, Bill? I mean, no pressure to say us sitting here, you know, <laughs> but just wondering. Like of all the amazing actors you've worked with, are there any actors you'd love to work with again? They're all dead. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll say anybody. Said, that's what he said. He said yes, ah, yes. We're the only ones still alive. <laughs> <think. laughs> nice <laughs> process of elimination. I remember our show with just affection. I, I really had a great time on the show and with you kids when you were kids. And yeah. uh, it turned out very well as it, as it turned out. So I remember it very well. That's That's all I got to say. We remember it very well too, and we are um, 
very fortunate, as Will mentioned, mm. that we get to do conventions with you and we get to see you regularly. And I know how much that means to fans, too, that they get to tell you how much you mean to them. You are very special in so many people's lives. And, um, you know, I can very easily cry thinking about that last scene that we did with you at the end of our show. And for all the years we worked together, um, there was something so oh gosh, seeing you and being with you in that last scene in the classroom really nailed home for me that this was the end of an era. Yeah. And it also yeah. was very much the end of my childhood. I had been on yeah. Boy Meets World from 12 until I was 19 years old <laughs> and knowing the show was over and saying goodbye to all of these people and saying goodbye to all of these experiences that had really shaped, you know, the majority of my life at this point. Yeah. Um, you just, you are very special to me and I will love you and appreciate you forever. And I'm so lucky that I still get to see you and talk to you regularly. And I went to your book signing. I waited in line outside. And um, when they found out I was outside, Belle was like, what are you doing waiting in line? You could have told me you were coming. I was like, I wanted, I wanted the experience. I wanted yeah. to do it like everyone else. So just thank you for everything. You know, I think your show is one of the healthiest shows. Yeah. The healthiest yeah. comedies. And I, think I think so that's too. That's one of the reasons it, and you know, I say that we need that and people need that now, that kind of healthy thing that was part of that show. It really was. Yeah. 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 We love you, Bill. I don't know yeah, what else to Bill. say. We love you, Bonnie. Thank you both Thank so you guys much. Thank you so much for, for everything. For, it's, yeah, I cherish our memories and conversations. I'm so grateful. All that, the time. And here's to yeah. many, many more of them because we want to have you back because we're just scraping the surface of Mr. Feeney and Bill and Bonnie. I feel like you're sure. afraid to cry, Will, but you're I the closest. I am never afraid you're to the, cry. You're out of, out of all of us, you are the closest to Bill and Bonnie. I uh, I don't cry ever except at Feed the Birds uh, when they sing that on Mary Poppins. Everything else <laughs> is not sad at all. No, we, uh, we, we've gotten to know each other very well over the years, all of us, and it's uh, it's it's just amazing that we've been able to share all these experiences. So thank you for coming, both of you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. yeah. We really appreciate thank it. You. We love you guys. We love you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. What? That went great. Oh. oh, my God. They're so wonderful and so... The I, stories that man has, the life they have lived is just amazing. Watching their shorthand communication Ugh. where Bill will start to get like he's telling a story and then he'll start to get distracted and think, what was I? What was my point? And he'll just look at her and she'll go. And then and yep. she gives him like a, and he's like, yep. right. And like watching their shorthand yep. together is just amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, it's fine. We we've talked a lot about. The, you know, just recognizing how old everybody, like when we were kids, everyone was just blanket adults. Yeah. <laughs> like by the time they were on that, we met them. I mean, the, the wealth of acting experience and, and like industry experience, like I just, I just can't believe I didn't take more advantage of it, you know, because I think in my, at the time, I mean, this is just part of being an adolescent. You think, you know, everything. And obviously like I knew Bill had done a lot, but, um, you know, I, I just wish I had a tape recorder. I can go back in time and yeah. ask him about all those things. Just every once in a while, he would just open up his mouth and tell a story like the zoo story, Broadway and or uh, working on The Graduate or any of in every single one of them are they're legendary. Uh, I So it's you know, it's it's one of those things like you you realize almost too late, always like, oh, we should have been writing this down. Or recording. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, again, though, when you're a kid, you, you know, your yeah. life is going to last forever. And, you you know, we were taking every day for granted that we were while, while yeah. we were on the set of Boy Meets World. And you're not thinking about your craft when you're 13, 14. No. I mean, not at all. No. And you also think you also have this weird thing like, I don't know, at least I did where. um <sighs> I guess I, I guess I just didn't, you just don't think of your career beyond the, the one, the moment you're in, Sure, you know, like sure. the idea that like, well, Boy Meets World is going to end and 
And then you, you might be on, in like 50 other TV shows like Bill Daniels. That was just impossible to imagine, sure. you know. But like at that point, they had already they, they had a full a whole life of, of, of acting and being in the business, which I just don't think you can recognize as a teenager. You just think that like oh, it's always just going to be like this forever, not realizing that like, first of all, the chances of you being able to continue working are so slim because yeah. you have to, you know, just get the jobs. And then just to have the tenacity and the willpower to stick it out um it's so hard it's so hard and to be positive about it have a positive attitude i mean you know there's a reason that most people stop acting in their 20s yeah. especially don't when you were a child actor forced into the industry which he was i mean if you read his book he was there and he talked about it in the interview but he i mean forced into the industry and we've talked about how easy it is to get that love of entertainment or love of acting just beaten out of you at, at a young age and for him to then take his own career by the reins and go, no, now I'm in charge. I'm going to learn the craft and I'm going to go from there. It's so rare and just amazing to have that longevity in, in this industry and, yeah. and hit every single version of the industry from Broadway to play to regular yeah. plays to Broadway to understudying to I mean he's hit every possible sitcom drama level. Yeah. sitcom drama you name Film. it he's done it yeah I mean a uh, voiceover I mean he was Kit on Knight Rider he's uh, hit. we didn't even talk about no, Kit we didn't even get into Knight Rider I well, mean well that was a question that's a question I wanted to ask you guys what was your knowledge of Bill Daniels when you met him or what did you know him from when you when when you met him on set? I had three very important things to me. Kit from Knight Rider was very important to me. Um, yeah. Obviously, um, uh, the Graduate. Uh, just as you know, I, a someone who loved film, quote unquote, by you know sixteen. Really? So you already knew the Graduate. Oh, I already absolutely knew okay. the Graduate, but I also knew um, it's not called Death Becomes or what's it called. There's a, a, a the Ferdell family has. We were big movie fans, but it was always kind of schlocky movies. Like, we, wait, I know which one you're going to say because this was my answer. Which one? Her alibi. Yes, yes. Oh my yes! gosh, that's Dude, it. That's how it. That's what I realized because I was sitting here because yes. I, I I thought of this question and I was like, what was the name of that movie? Because it was the only thing I really knew Bill from. It's a 1989 movie with Tom Selleck. He's a, and it's, it's a, a great total movie. schlocky, like pa erotic thriller, I think. It's Paulina. It's, called, it's Tom Selleck, Paulina Poroskova, yeah. who's who's a, yes. a supermodel and she plays Tom yes. Selleck's girl, like girlfriend. And then there's Bill Daniels, who's like his his right his literary agent. His liter because he's a novelist. He's a yeah. novelist. It's That's a great exactly movie. Thing. It's a great I don't know if it is. I do. It's definitely of that tradition like in the late 80s early 90s those sort of like tight thrillery you know it was a comedic uh, thriller wait you guys this is this is nuts i didn't know he was in that movie but that movie plays a very integral part in my like childhood stories really because what? yes because my parents had rented it from like blockbuster and it was on the kitchen counter and my brother walked by and said what's her alibi <laughs> and it was just one of those moments like where one like of those family one jokes. of those family jokes where everything was it's her alibi it's her alibi wow. and I, we've told that story a million times of oh remember the time chris oh, thought man. alibi was alibi oh we should I, we should have brought this up to bill because i mean i i, I was gonna of, but then i was like we're talking in his about career Emmys in his and, career i'm so curious where her alibi falls like can, it must be so low on the totem pole I, so of like one of important the important career milestones seriously but for me that's exactly what i knew him from me too and then it wasn't until we were filming our third or fourth episode Episode, and we were doing a note session with Michael Jacobs and Bill leaned forward and said, now, Michael, Michael, Michael. and I went, I know that voice. <laughs> and I hadn't, I hadn't really grown up with TV, but I did know yeah. uh, Knight Rider because of course everybody in school would talk about Knight Rider. And so I knew his voice the second I heard. And I remember going to Universal Studios as a kid and you could go talk to Kit in yep. the car. Yes, you and they could. had somebody doing an impersonation of Bill of Daniel's Bill Dan voice. Yeah. No, so, yeah, was, those are the only two things I knew him from. And on everything else I had to learn while working with him because he would never talk about stuff either. No. Like, yeah. you know, he would never brag. He would never. But and, that's and why getting never, Bonnie on the show was so fun because she would yeah. come in and in front of him start telling Bill Daniel stories. Yeah. yeah. And she was kind of like pulling the curtain back. And it, and you could tell she loved to do that. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. could tell Bill did not she like it. She didn't even do <laughs> exactly. She's like, he's an angry man. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> he was, you know, I thought it was uh, going to be a horrible father. No. She's so honest. She, and I, I love it. No filter. Because he's much more reserved. He's yes. much more reserved. One of the first moments I can remember actually connecting with, not connecting with Bill, but going up and saying, I'm going to talk to him and just see, I quoted him to him from her alibi. And he went, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> like that was it. Oh yeah, because yeah, I can. I, I mean, said I, that. I just it was it was it was like oh okay because that was what we did in our family. My family we are huge movie quote people. So I was like I'm gonna go quote it to the guy, and it didn't go over that well. Yeah. <laughs> I was like okay. Glenn Balloon, her yeah. alibi. That's so funny. Oh, anyway, man. that was amazing. I'm so glad. I'm so glad they were here. Oh man, I could talk to him forever. All right. So up next, we are going to talk episode number 103, Father Knows Less. It is directed by David Trainer. It originally aired October 8th, 1993. And yeah, thank you for being here with us. You can follow us on Instagram at Pod Meets World Show. And you can also email us your questions or your thoughts at Pod Meets World Show at gmail.com. And merch t shirts yes. are available at Pod Meets World Show.com. They're pretty great. I want a shirt. I think we can get you one. Can we get, can we get one? I think I, so. I'd, I'd like to get a shirt. Are you interested in a shirt? Me? No, I, I, I guess he's <laughs> I not. I don't wear my hair on my shirt. I don't <laughs> wear shirts. That's what Ryder's like. I don't wear shirts. He's just Too much shirtless shirts, all guys. the time. Too much shirts. Too much shirts. <laughs> we love you all. Pod dismissed. Pod Meets World is an iHeart podcast produced and hosted by Danielle Fischel, Will Friedel, and Ryder Strong. Executive producers, Jensen Karp and Amy Sugarman. Executive in charge of production, Danielle Romo. Producer and editor, Tara Sudbach. Producer, Lorraine Burez. Engineer and Boy Meets World superfan, Easton Allen. Our theme song is by Kyle Morton of Typhoon. Follow us on Instagram at Pod Meets World Show or email us at podmeetsworldshow at gmail.com. 